All right, so good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on managing calves for improved productivity and reduced antimicrobial use. My name is Stacey Domalewski. I am the Extension Assistant with the Beef Cattle Research Council and I'll be your moderator for tonight. You and approximately 180 other people from all across Canada have registered, as well as a few international guests. Tonight, about 50% of our webinar audience is cattle producers. The session will last for approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions that you have during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, you can tweet along with us tonight using hashtag beefwebinar. You'll also find their information and other organizations' webinars as well. We are recording this session, so I'll email you out a link to the recording to everyone that registered at the end of the week. If you miss hearing anything and want to watch it again, you can. I also encourage you to take some notes as well that you can look up later and will help you to remember more of what you hear. Of course, through the webinar tonight, we, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters but we can't hear or see you. So if you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have questions or comments for either of the presenters or myself, that's the place to do it. And feel free to send questions in at any time and we'll answer them towards the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow, it might help to close the webcam window so that means you won't be able to see us, but it may help the audio come through a little more clearly. All right, so let's get started. So here's what we'll be covering tonight. First, we'll start off with hearing from our science director at the Beef Cattle Research Council. Then we'll hand it over to Brenda Grant with Canfax Research Services. And then we'll hear from Dr. Cody Creelman. We'll open it up to any questions from you and then finish the webinar by letting you know where to find more information that you'll be interested in and can also use on your farm and ranch. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker this evening, Dr. Reynold Bergen. Reynold is the Science Director at the Beef Cattle Research Council. In a nutshell, his job is to talk about science to people in the industry and to talk about the industry to scientists. If you subscribe to the Canadian Cattlemen's Magazine, you've already seen a bit of what he does through the research column he writes for every issue. All right, so take it away, Reynold. There, can you see my screen? There we go. How's this look? There we go, looks good, we can see it. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent, okay. All right, thanks. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the National Checkoff, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we fund. So in uh, a lot of provinces, well, every province actually, um, cattle producers pay two different checkoffs. They pay a provincial checkoff, and that checkoff funds two things. It funds all the provincial activities that go on, whether that's advocacy or policy research, uh, marketing, that sort of thing within the province, and it also funds CCA activities like lobbying, uh, legal activities, trade advocacy, like the current TPP negotiations, that sort of thing. There's also a national checkoff, and that national checkoff funds two things. It funds Canada Beef Inc. to do the, the national and international marketing and promotion, and it also funds the Beef Cattle Research Council to do, to do research. Um, the national checkoff actually doesn't fund the CCA. The CCA gets funded through the provincial checkoff. Now, we're the Beef, Beef Cattle Research Council. We're funded by this 
part of this national checkoff dollar. We've been around since the late 1990s, and our job is essentially to fund research and tech transfer that will contribute to the industry's competitiveness and sustainability. We're funded um, by, I like this, there's a typo here, it's between 7.5 cents to 30 cents um, of each of the national checkoff dollars. That's always decided by the individual provinces. We collect all those dollars and, and then we leverage them against other provincial and, and federal funders um, on a three to one basis. So we turn each dollar into four. And the funding decisions at BCRC are made by 11 producers that, that are appointed by the provincial associations. And so here's how the funding breakdown varies by province right now. It varies from seven and a half cents per animal marketed in, in, uh, in Manitoba, all the way up to 30 cents in Saskatchewan. I'm fairly delighted to uh, point out that Ontario has recently went from two and a half cents up to 17 and a half cents. So we're delighted to have uh, some additional dollars to invest in national research programs. So what we do um, to turn each dollar into four is by taking our national checkoff dollars, leveraging them with other federal and other provincial and industry dollars through something called the Beef Science Cluster. And our, what we funded and how we funded has changed over the years. So up until 2008, we, were, um, we weren't getting, you know, seven and a half to 15 or seven and a half to 30 cents on the dollar. We were only getting on average about a nickel on the dollar. And so what that meant was that we were um, not able to fund everything that we probably needed to. And there were some areas that we were really, really underfunding. So we put, a, you know, a lot of our focus into animal health, just about a half of our dollars went towards that. Yeah, maybe only about 10% went to forage and grassland research. And some areas like environment, animal welfare, tech, tech transfer, we weren't active in at all because we simply didn't have the money. Between 2009-2013, um, the uh, checkoff allocation actually went up to about 10 cents on average across the country. So that allowed us to, to balance our funding a little bit more. So this is percent of funding. This isn't actual dollars. But what you'd see here with the red bars that we got a lot more balanced. We could fund in more areas to a you know more proportional uh, manner. And we could actually start to di dip our toe a little bit into things like animal welfare and tech transfer that we'd never been able to before. And then where we're currently at right now is that we're, we're uh, at 15 cents on average across the, the country, kind of maintaining that portfolio approach to research and, you know, increasing our activities in things like animal welfare and tech transfer, also getting a little bit more involved in things like, uh, like the environment. What you'll see is that a couple of things have come down proportionally, animal health, simply because we've been more active in other areas, and food safety has really dropped off, and that's simply because we're running out of, of food safety researchers to fund, uh, largely due to retirements. We're still putting limited funds into tech transfer, but at least it's going up, and that those dollars into tech transfer are things that, that support activities like this uh, this website that we've had up for a couple of years at beefresearch.ca. I'm not going to belabor this too much because you're all here, so you're likely aware of it. Funds the, the communication and whatnot that we do through the blog. Um, you know, supports webinars like this one that you're watching now um, and the ones that we've done in the past that are archived. And... Uh, you know, but doing all of this stuff costs money. We're doing more, um, but that national checkoff dollar has been at $1 since 1994, and that dollar is funding both marketing and research. And so funding on both of those sides, both the marketing side and the research side, is, is really tight right now. Um, between inflation and fewer and fewer cattle being in the countryside, going to market and whatnot, the, uh, there's fewer dollars that are around for, for research. And so what that means is that, that we aren't able to invest enough in all of these areas that we actually need to be active in right now. And so as I pose a couple of problems, and one of the big ones is that there's increasing demands by government for industry to be involved. And if industry doesn't show its support for these programs through actual dollar investments, then the government isn't going to either. 
And in the past, we've seen research programs get cut and research programs disappear, and we've lost a lot of forage researchers across the country because of, because of things like that. And the same thing hap can happen on the marketing side. And so for the last n number of years, we've been able to do a really, really good job of, of becoming a lot more focused and a lot more strategic and efficient with, with the funding allocations we make. Um, but with funding being what it is now, both research and marketing initiatives are, are very much at, at risk. And so um, both provincial and, and national groups have, have come together from across the country. So we've got BCRC Canada Beef, CCA, Canadian Beef Breeds, National Cattle Feeders, and quite a number of the different provincial organi beef organizations have come together and developed a national strategy, a national funding plan, laying out the case for increased national checkoff funding both in terms of, of work plans on the marketing side, on the research side, as well as budgets to, to back up what, what those, those uh, plans, work plans are. Now the strategy is available online at beefstrategy.com and it's also going to be discussed at, at provincial beef producer meetings across the country this fall and winter and I would encourage each and every one of you that's uh, here now to uh, attend one of your meetings this fall, this winter, one of your provincial beef meetings, pick up a neighbor on your way there and go and participate in that discussion. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Stacy. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Reynold. If anybody has any questions for Reynold, go ahead and type them in the box at any time, and he'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. So next, we're going to hear from Brenna Grant. Brenna is the manager at Canfax Research Services, which provides marketing, statistical, and economic analysis to the Canadian beef industry, including economic economical analysis for us here at the BCRC in order to evaluate the performance of past research and help inform ongoing research priorities. Brenna also provides information on Canadian and international markets to producers to help them make more informed decisions. So please welcome Brenna. There, you should now be able to see me. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to start with providing some statistics and some economics of preconditioning. And the Western Cow-Calf Survey reported that only 9% of producers preconditioned in 2013. And there are some valid economic reasons of why that was the case. Um, frequently, producers will consider preconditioning when they have extra feedstuffs around or when feed prices are low, and they're looking to add value to that product by putting weight onto cows. Um, or, alternatively, they may be considering preconditioning when prices are low and they want to actually sell their calves into a different market. So they're wanting to retain their calves um, until prices maybe recover. But right now, when prices are at their highest level that we've seen in a really long time, there's actually an opportunity for producers. The cost of death loss at the feedlot is at one of the highest levels we've ever seen. And therefore, there's the potential of premiums becoming available um, because it's more profitable for a feedlot to pay that premium and have a calf that's going to survive versus have something that um, may be immune, immune compromised um, in those first 45 days. And so we're going to look at a couple of price risks, so your seasonality to your feeder prices, um, and 
your slide as you have a heavier calf to sell. Um, and then also looking at what are the potential premiums and what are the premiums needed to make preconditioning viable. And then looking at the performance risks as well. Um, if you've never preconditioned before, um, you may not know what your average daily gain is going to be on your calves and you don't know how they're going to perform. Um, and then knowing your costs is really critical. And so while you may have considered preconditioning in the past uh, for a number of reasons, it's really um, prudent to look at the pros and cons um, as you move forward, uh, particularly in this new price market. So looking at price seasonality, uh, you can see the blue bar. Um, this is looking at typically selling your calves in October and then how prices seasonally soften throughout the fall into November and December as feedlots fill their pens and demand softens. We see those prices slide. In 2014, we obviously had that big bull market where prices were increasing throughout the year, even the fall run. And this really paid off for producers who were able to retain ownership because not only were they able to sell the additional pounds, but they were able to sell them at a higher price. And so 2014 was the ideal year for preconditioning, but that's not necessarily going to be the case moving forward. Right now, in 2015, we're looking at a more seasonal year, and in fact, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen quite a bit of pressure on the live cattle futures, um, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, as well as the feeder futures as we look at some of the prices in the U.S., and we're probably going to see at least that seasonal decline from October through December, and historically that's been about 8% but it could be even larger than that. So keep some of those things in mind as you're planning. Now in terms of premiums, um, you can see here the premiums that have been needed historically um, for 30, 45, or 60 days. And in the U.S., they have a very strong history of providing premiums on preconditioned calves, um, particularly at pre-sort sales and those types of things, uh, reputation cattle. But in Canada, we really don't have that history of preconditioned premiums. And research that was done in October of 2011 and 2012 actually reported that um, in two different auction markets in Alberta, in the foothills, there was actually no preconditioned premium seen at all. And in Red Deer, where you had more mixed grain producers, you saw a very small premium of 0.8%. So that's less than 1%. And you can tell from the chart here that it's less than what would have been needed for any of these time periods of preconditioning. Obviously, 2014 was a completely different year. We saw all those prices rally, and you didn't need any premium at all to make preconditioning work. And that's something that I strongly recommend when you do your planning is what would be needed um, with no premium, and that way any premium that you are able to capture is um, gravy. So then moving on to some of the production risks, we're looking at cost of gain. Now historically, you would have needed to have less than 80 cents per pound for your cost of gain to make preconditioning work. When you have higher prices though, every pound added is actually worth more. And so you can invest more into adding those pounds than you would have historically. And so we've got a variety of prices here um, in terms of break-evens for your different time periods. But talking with producers and visiting with them over the last couple of weeks, we're looking at costs around that 125 per pound. And you want to make sure that when you're calculating this, that you're including all of your yardage and your labor um, interest, all of those things that can be um, somebody uh, easy to forget um, because it's definitely more than just what is the feed that you have on hand. Then looking at performance risk, um, average daily gain historically, you really needed to be looking at some of that compensatory gain and around 2.4 to 2.6 pounds per day. But again, 
looking at the current price market and price levels, you really only need 1.2 to 1.6 pounds per day. And this really opens up preconditioning for producers that may not have been able to push their cattle, um, had the facilities or the resources to push their cattle up and that, to that two pounds plus, you know, looking at one and a half pounds per day is actually something that's very doable. So I want to actually go onto the internet and show you a tool. So this is at beefresearch.ca and if you go under research to their animal health area you can scroll down and you'll find preconditioning and this is um, one of the decision making tools that they have on there. And so it's going to ask you for some general market information. So I'm assuming that you're from Alberta, you calve in March, you know, some standard information. You've got a 480 pound calf in mid-October, looking to typically sell the third week of October. And this is one where this model is based on historical prices and historical seasonality. So really, the long-term average for calf prices in Alberta was around 150. This is a 10-year average of 130. But you can actually put in a current price for this year at about $300, and we're above that right now, but expecting some of that seasonal price slide to occur in the first three weeks of October. So that gives you, at weaning, a projected price of around $13.50 per head. And we're gonna put in, and we're gonna actually put in quite a conservative one and a half pounds per day. You can change this if you frequently, if you know your cattle, and that you would get around 1.8, you could put that in. We're going to up this shrink to about four. And we're going to come on down and we're going to look at these costs. Now, I would mentioned that the costs that we're hearing about are about that 125 per pound. I want you to note that these feed costs are in dollars per day per head. So I'm going to put this at 1.1. And you're going to see this actually changes the number at the bottom. So 125 per day is um, 250, sorry, 125 um, per pound is about uh, 225 uh, per day, and that gives you about $67 um, over a 30-day period. So that's what we're looking at on our cost side. We're going to put in that seasonal slide. So this gives you your 10-year seasonal adjustment um, based on your time period. And in this case, it's all a minus 8 over your period. And then we're going to actually take these projected premiums and we're going to put them all to zero saying what could you do this simply for yourself with no premium and we'll go down and we can see the results and so what this shows is that a 30-day program you would actually lose money of around $30 per head if you didn't have a premium. But this actually shows down at the bottom here, if you had a 2% premium, you would break even. If you had anything above a 2% premium, or if the price slide was smaller than that seasonal 8%, this would actually be positive. Your 45-day program is really your break-even scenario right now with about $5 per head more but it's your 60 days um, and this is really where your average daily gain really shines through for preconditioning because it's those additional pounds that really make it pay and in this case you've got forty dollars per head more and you don't need a premium at all to make that work. Um, this also shows that uh, if you actually had instead of eight percent price slide if it was up to an eleven percent price slide, you would be breaking even. And I'm going to hand it back over to Stacy. Thanks, Brenna. So once again, if anybody has any questions for her, go ahead and type them in the box at any time and she will answer them towards the end of the webinar. So I now have the, I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Cody Krillman. Cody is a veterinarian at Veterinary Agri-Health Services in Airdrie, Alberta, where he works with both cow-calf producers and feedlots. 
His interests include pathology, large animal surgery, cow-calf and feedlot production medicine, as well as using mobile technology in the field. If you're on social media, you're probably already familiar with him because he's committed to sharing photos, videos, and stories that allow the world to see what the daily life of a cow vet is like. So please welcome Cody. Beautiful introduction. Speaking of my social media peeps, this chat room is uh, pretty quiet, so let's get some uh, noise up in there. Where are you all from? My screen's good. Mm, let's get yes, it is. Slideshow. Everything's good? Yep. So you guys can see? Sure can. Okay, perfect. All right, everybody. Uh, that was a beautiful introduction. So that's right. We are, uh, I'm part of Veterinary AgriHealth Services in Airdrie, Alberta. We are five vet practice, and we deal nothing with, uh, with anything to do with anything besides beef cattle. Uh, so that's 100% cow, calf, and feedlot only. Uh, we service clients across Western Canada, so we have a pretty good pulse on on what's going uh, on in BC, Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. So let's get into preconditioning from my perspective. So by tradition, uh, preconditioning is anything that is vaccination, nutritional, or a management program that is designed to prepare young cattle to best withstand the stretches, stresses of adjustment when they leave their point of origin, enter the channels of trade, and at their final destination. Now that's, uh, that's quite the mouthful, so I like to make everything as simple as possible. Uh, so that you get the cow vet dictionary version. So preconditioning is basically anything you can do to a wean calf so it shrinks less and it doesn't get pneumonia and die at the feedlot. So you can see my some of my lovely staff at the bottom here cutting out dead. So this is what we're trying to, to prevent in the feedlot. So what preconditioning means is it can mean anything. It's a spectrum. It can mean nearly nothing. A single black leg shot by some people's definition could be could be called preconditioning. Uh, or it can be, it can mean everything. It could be an extremely comprehensive, progressive uh, herd health program that focuses on everything you could ever focus on uh, when it comes to, to vaccinating these calves and providing the proper nutrition and, and the best management possible. So what I'm going to do, because I'm not sure if everybody's kind of familiar with the end result of calves going into the feedlot, is is kind of reverse engineer where we, where the end point. Uh, and then go backwards to what can be done on the cow-calf ranch to make things a little bit better. So, for example, when we get these auction source balling calves anywhere between five and 700 pounds, when they hit the feedlot, most likely they're going to get an antibiotic, and they're going to get an expensive antibiotic uh, called a mac macrolide. So uh, an example would be Draxin or Zuprevo or Zactran. Uh, they're also going to get a, a viral vaccine to protect against any of the respiratory pathogens on the viral side. And then they're also going to get vaccinated for the bacterial pathogens, so the main ones being Manheimia hemolytica and uh, Histophilus somni. Sometimes they'll get Pasteurella multocida. Uh, it's not too common in Western Canada. And then those calves are also going to get a, a seven-way or an eight-way, just depending on your geographical region. And they're probably going to get Ivamec or Safeguard for Parasites. So there's a lot of inputs going into these calves simply for the fact that the buyer does not know any history on these animals and they have to do everything possible uh, and get those calves immunized, get them on antibiotics because they do not know that history and things can go bad uh, if these cattle are set up for disaster. So overall just on arrival feedlot input costs uh, just those vaccines, just that antibiotics, automatically is $25 to $30 a head that they have to put in because they just do not know the history of those animals. And what does that, you know, that $1,800 calf plus $25 to $30 worth of vaccine and antibiotics get you? 
like gets you a five to six percent BRD first pull. So BRD being uh, bovine respiratory disease. That's our calf killer. This is our shipping fever, pneumonia. Uh, this this starts up right as soon as those cattle get into the feedlot, and it's uh, it's going to affect a lot of calves. So it gets you five to six percent, and it also gets you uh, one to five percent mortality. And that mortality can be even higher depending on the class of cattle. You know, not all cattle are created equal. Here's a nice example of that shipping fever. So this is a lung, uh, the side section of a lung. The chest has been open, and you can see all the inflammatory process going on. Uh, these lungs are completely trashed just solely because of shipping fever pneumonia. And what is the cost of that single case of bovine respiratory disease? Well, you know, based on some of my modeling and, and uh, supported by research across North America, those calves will have 0.8 pounds per day less average daily gain throughout the entire feeding period. That's almost a pound less than their pen mates just because of that one single sickness, that one single episode. They're going to have worse feed conversion. They're going to get pulled out of that pen. They're going to get... 20 to 30 dollars worth of antibiotics again uh, to try to treat that animal and uh, they're gonna get you know about 12 dollars worth in time and labor shoot charge so overall with the price of cattle that adds up to anywhere between 100 and 175 dollars per head just from getting sick that's not dying just from getting sick so that can add up big time and then when it comes to, to mortality uh, each 1% change in death loss can, can equal up to $20 per head depending on your purchase price. So even that becomes very, very expensive. That's $20 per head you know, spread across that. So you're buying in that death loss and, and that, can be, that can be huge. That can add up so much. So what does preconditioning do overall? Well, one thing it can do if done right is it can decrease BRD pulls, so that shipping fever pulls from 5% to 0%. An example of that would be the, the BRD guarantee that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies uh, puts out there. So, so cattle that are from a select vac herd, so the cows have been treated uh, with a, a respiratory pathogen uh, vaccine, and then those calves are treated anywhere between uh, branding time and three weeks prior to weaning. If they then come into the feedlot and they're, they're that certified herd, they come into the feedlot and they then receive everything that, that that calf receives anyways if it was coming from an auction mart, so a shot of a macrolide, another, uh, another set of vaccines, that company actually guarantees 0% BRD pulls because those cat just for the sole fact that those cattle have, uh, have never been exposed uh, or sorry, that just from the fact that those cattle have been exposed to vaccines before. So just from the vaccination standpoint, you could really drop those BRD pulls big time. And, and that company will actually pay for any BRD pull uh, in, within the first 30 days within the, within the feedlot pen. So we're going to also have a decrease in mortality. We'll have reduced uh, days on feed, an increased average daily gain, improved feed efficiency, overall decreased... Uh, antibiotic usage, improved marbling, improved quality grade, all of this data is out there uh, showing what, what preconditioned calves can do once they hit the feedlot. Uh, reduce shrink, we reduce our reliance on antibiotics. Uh, I, I uh, do not look forward to the day when antibiotics do not work as well as they did. Uh, so, so we have to do more than, than what we're doing in our current system. And just a basic uh, increase in animal welfare. So by decreasing BRD pull rates and by decreasing uh, mortality, we're increasing welfare, and you know we're improving consumer perception of what we do as an industry. So when it comes to vaccination, what we can do in the cow herd is make sure that they are vaccinated properly. Everything starts with with that fetus. So making sure those cows are up to date on their vaccines protect against all the respiratory pathogens, BRD uh, prevention there. And then simply vaccinating those calves somewhere between six and eight weeks of age uh, and then all the way up to three weeks pre-weaning. We have this great big window. We're usually running those calves through at branding time, that six to eight week window anyways. So why not just go ahead and give them all of the vaccines that they need in order to become preconditioned. And, and when they receive that, that vaccination 
at the feedlot that's acting as a boost, not as a primary vaccination. And then the other thing that's important is if you're going to retain those calves for that 30, 45, 60 days post weaning, to also repeat those vaccines uh, at the appropriate time to make sure that they do have a boost and, uh, and you're not taking on too much additional risk. When it comes down to nutrition, that's so important. So it's important for these calves to, to be uh, acquainted with feed bunks, to actually know where the feed is coming from. You know, they're, they're looking at the udder and they're looking at the grass because that's where the food has come from over the last six months. Uh, so they need some sort of transition period. They can't just go to the feedlot and uh, wander around lost uh, until they just one day bump into the feed bunk. And then same thing with water troughs. They might not be exposed to traditional water troughs. So, uh, exposing calves to those types of things, uh, both pre-weaning and post-weaning, is extremely important. Also, a high-quality feed. You know, these calves are an important investment, so we might as well be giving them the best we have on the farm. Uh, and consulting with the nutritionists as well. There's just so many opportunities out there for you to consult with uh, professionals on making sure these calves are getting exactly what they need, uh, and making sure you include the, the minerals and the salts as well. And it is amazing. You can get up to three pounds uh, per day of, of gain at home. Uh, it, it may take a little bit of practice to get that. Uh, I would say that's a that's a good goal to get to, a gold standard. But but if you can achieve that three pounds uh, per head per day extra, that's a lot of saleable pounds after that 30, 45, 60 days. That that uh, is really going to put some extra cash in your jeans for sure. And then there's also some management things we can do too. So just making sure that everything's dehorned and castrated. There's no reason to take a, a dock at the auction mart or at the feedlot because these calves came in with horns and, and castrated. That should have been done long, long ago. Uh, preferably no dehorning at all. And uh, you know, there's other things that we can do to just decrease the overall stress, allow those animals to have a boost in their immunity. The less stress we have, the better immunity we have. So we can do lower stress. Uh, weeding methods. I don't think there's anything as a, a no stress weeding method, but there is a lot of things we can do out there. Here's a little baby calf. This is my animal health technician's calf, Itchy. Uh, she's basically the pet of the herd, and uh, she was not impressed when they put one of these uh, quiet wean nose weaners on there. Uh, but hopefully, she'll she won't be too mad. Uh, it just makes these calves, you know, less stress, better immunity, but also it's just easier to manage. If you're going to keep these calves for 30, 45, 60 days, we know that that uh, they can be hard on your fences, and that's one of the reasons why guys don't want to keep it around. They just don't think they're set up, and that might be true if you just run that calf right off the cow, but, uh, you know, you've got cows crashing through fences and calves crashing through fences, and you've got alley rats and calves out on the highway. Uh, I get why that's scary, but there is some things we can do to mitigate that risk for sure. And then even just, you know, uh, some of the management things we can do is for marketing those calves ranch direct. So we can decrease their overall uh, transport time. Those calves are going to come in with full gut. They're going to have some reserve. They're going to be hydrated. Uh, and then we're also just decreasing the overall co-mingling of those cattle with, with cattle that have an unknown vaccine history and just overall an unknown health status. So decrease the total, you know, bug soup uh, kind of kindergarten effect of going through the auction mart system can be a viable option of when it comes to management as well. So here's just a basic uh, example uh, of what a preconditioning system can look like. Uh, so the cow herd receives a modified live and a clust radial shot at preg test. So that's pretty easy, pretty fast. Uh, then calves would also receive a modified live viral vaccine with Mannheimia included. So an example would be Pyramid plus Prespawn, so Bovashield, uh, Gold One Shot. And then they're also receiving their Clostridial or their Black Lake vaccine plus uh, Histophilus somni. Uh, and then all the producer did was high quality hay added to a calf only bunk two weeks prior to weaning and did a low stress lower stress fence line weaning. And that could be considered preconditioned and, and something that you could uh, get some premiums out of as well. So why isn't preconditioning happening? So one of the reasons we're having this webinar today is just is, is lack of understanding. So there's just not as much information out there. Some of the information is confusing. Uh, even, for, even for the professionals, it can be confusing going through some of the literature and, and what is best. So just getting more education out there, I think will really help that. Uh, preconditioning is hard. Uh, 
you know, that's a lot of extra work to run calves through and vaccinate them, to keep calves around, feed, feed calves, uh, you know, for a period of time after they're weaned. But unfortunately, most things in life that are worth uh, having are usually hard to get. So uh, it can be hard. I understand that. But sometimes it is worth it. Uh, the premium isn't seen as worth it, and it not it not always is worth it. Uh, you know, if you can get that premium, that's great. But by preconditioning alone, that does not by any means uh, say that that you're going to get that premium out of it. Uh, cow, calf producers, you know, as of last year and even to a point this year, they're making money without doing preconditioning. So really, why bother? Uh, if you're making that cash and uh, that's easy money, uh, you know, you might as well make it as easy as as you can on yourself, but it still doesn't make it right because on the flip side, I'm still seeing you know what I see in the feedlot, and and we need to mitigate that as well. Uh, deferred risk. This is one that going back to I always get uh, challenged with. The cow calf producer is very worried about you know keeping those calves after weaning because what if one dies? You know there goes that big a profit margin. What if a bunch get sick. What if I get into a wreck? You know, there's a lot of uncertainty there, so it's easier to just defer that risk onto the feedlot. And that that also comes to my next point. It's it's still even though we're the same industry, I still feel there's a lot of us versus them out there. Uh, you know, the cow calf guy versus the feedlot. A lot of mistrust, a lot of distrust. Uh, it's it's not so simple, and and some of that is justified, and some of it isn't. Uh, but I think for the good of the animal, from my perspective, will help us. You know. Pull us back together and work together, uh, and also improve consumer perception as well. And then there's also an asymmetry uh, of information out there as well. So this one's very interesting to me. So there's a lot of times where you guys are doing, you know, as producers are doing a lot of really good things, and you are preconditioning your calves to to a certain point. Uh, you know, even if that's just branding time vaccine, you are doing things, but that information is not just being is not being relayed to the buyer. Uh, to the fullest extent. Uh, there's some reasons for that. Uh, it's probably a little controversial right now. I was talking to one of my producers today about this topic and and uh, you know there there's there's more money to be made from a from a, a cattle buyer's perspective by having the baseline of the price on calves that are are auction mark derived and have no preconditioning on them. That's the majority of the calves and if they can keep that price there and not have these preconditioned calves that you know this elevated premium that's that's good for them but that's not necessarily good for everyone but that we can get into that topic some other time but there is things out there that can uh, kind of dissolve and, and make it so there's there's more transfer of this information uh, things like traceability programs these certified preconditioning programs are really good and then also electronic and video auctions where you can call your own cattle you can help put up the the call sheet and uh, really make sure all the information that you've done on those calves is, is disseminated appropriately. And like I said before, you have to make sure um, that you're going to get money out of this if you're going to do it. So that price premium does not necessarily equal more money. Uh, that extra cost and preconditioning, as we heard in the last presentation, can vary. Uh, it can be due to weight increases or it can be due to that seasonality. So what would I do? I'm not supposed to ever say what I would do, but I like to say what I would do. So if I were a producer, I would make sure that I knew my input costs uh, as best as I possibly could, and I can figure out what type of preconditioning system was best going to fit my individual system of, of raising cattle. So I would consult with the veterinarian, the nutritionist, even there's so many marketing consultants out there now. Uh, just so many resources that I get enough, enough information out there to, to make that system work for me. And then there's also this price discovery perspective. So, you know, I would just go out there, implement the program, that preconditioning program, develop relationships with feedlots. I think sometimes the, fair, the, the feedlots can be, uh, you know, kind of lumped in, in, a, in an area that where they don't seem approachable, but they absolutely want these types of cattle. Uh, perhaps even sell them direct and then you know without even expecting to get that premium 
uh, with that strong relationship with the feedlot, what I would do is I would I would ask if I could follow that health and carcass data through the system. So something like that would be so easy for me to pull out of my feedlot health software program. Is is what did those individual calves do and follow them right through to the to the finish period. And then even with tools like VIX, like the Beef Info Exchange System, you could extract your carcass data back out and then you could use that personalized data uh, to leverage buyers in subsequent years. So you could say like, look, I put all this work into my calves. This is what it cost me. This is what it's going to cost you. But this is what it's going to save you because I actually have the numbers in front of me. So I think that's my little soapbox, my last slide there. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, any questions, any concerns, ask me now in the chat or just get a hold of me. Uh, email, phone, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever you want. I'll respond uh, whenever and, and get back to you. Uh, I think we have some questions now that uh, we'll just go through quick. And I just want to get a pulse on what's going on out there in terms of the producers that we have with us right now. All right. Thanks very much, Cody. So um, as he mentioned, we are going to launch some poll questions right now. So your answers to these are completely anonymous. So they'll come up on your screen. And if you can just select um, your answer. All right, so it looks like about half of you um, sh do precondition your calves, whereas the other half is split between no or it's not applicable. So our next poll question is, how much do you think preconditioning costs? So taking into effect the costs of vaccine, labor, um, other costs. Right, so it looks like about 60% of you think it's between the $20 and $40 range, 13% um, in the 0 to 20 range, and 24% in the $40 to $60 range. So our last question, what premium would make it worth it for you to precondition your calves? So we have the same answers as before, the 0 to 20, the 20 to 40, 40 to $60, or more than $60. Right, so it looks like most of you guys say between the $40 and $60 mark, 44% um, there, 29% in the 20 to 40%, and 0 to 20 is 13%, and 13% 13 of you um, say more than $60 a head would make it worth it to precondition your calves. All right, so now we are going to turn it over to the question part of the webinar here. So um, if you have any questions for any of the presenters, you can type them into the chat box on the side of your screen, and we will um, have all the presenters. Um, we'll ask them if you can please um, let me know who you're directing them to. So we did have a few questions submitted ahead of time. So first one for Cody. So can you comment on cross immunity for calves vaccinated um, if preconditioning, um, if the vaccines they're using are different in the feedlot than are if they're using different pharmaceutical companies than the vaccines that are being used at the ranch, if that makes sense. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, there is uh, absolutely cross protection. Uh, that as long as the antigen is the same, then there's no worries. So when it comes to our modified live virals, uh, it does not 
it does not matter one little bit uh, if you use Bowringer, if you use Merck, uh, you know, based off of the literature, not just my opinion, uh, there, there's absolutely no difference between them uh, when it comes down to that. Uh, same thing on the bacterial side, you're going to get that boost uh, if you're going with Manheimia, uh, Histophilus, Patriola Maltosta, or the eight ways, uh, no difference in, in the company as long as they're getting it. All right. Thank you very much. Um, our next question here. So, Cody, can you also comment on the risks that are associated with administering a modified live vaccine to pregnant cows? Absolutely. So, there are several modified live vaccines out there that do have a fetal protection claim. So if you're going to be administering those, any modified live to a pregnant cow, you have to make sure that it does have that fetal protection claim. Now the next thing is that you also have to make sure that those animals were administered that vaccine prior to pregnancy. And depending on the product, uh, it may require it to be two to three times uh, prior to that. Uh, they need to have seen those antigens before they got uh, pregnant. Then after that, if you followed the label claim perfectly, the, the risk level is extremely low with giving those modified lives uh, during that pregnancy. There is case reports out there uh, and also within the literature of some abortion happening uh, in, in very rare circumstances, uh, but that is, that is is few and far between uh, but the, the important thing, if you want to have, uh, if you want to have, I guess, backing from pharmaceutical companies, is to to have uh, a very good chain of evidence that those animals did in fact receive those vaccines when they should have, as per the label, and that they had also received it uh, according to label while they were pregnant. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so another question for Cody. What's a good way to prove to buyers or a feed lot that pre what preconditioning practices um, were done on the ranch? Okay, for sure. So absolutely working with the veterinarian. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other consultants that you could work up with that, but uh, you you should be, you know, whenever somebody produce, pr uh, comes to me with those types of questions, I can write... Uh, legal certificate saying that these cattle were in fact vaccinated based off of my history, uh, that you know I was standing there with the, the cows as they were being vaccinated, that I have good faith in, in this client. Uh, you know There is a lot of, of worry out there in the industry on the feedlot perspective that guys are saying that these animals are preconditioned, that they're not. Uh, the other way is also working with the pharmaceutical companies that have very good certificates uh, certificate programs to validate and verify that these animals are in fact uh, preconditioned the way that they are. Uh, but yeah, even just a simple phone call uh, saying, hey, Cody, uh, a feedlot's going to give you a call uh, based off of you know what I've been doing with my calves, and I would absolutely love and just support and back, back up any requests that way. So just working with the, the people that you work with to, to validate that and, and show that you know, you've been doing what you've said you've been doing for sure. But all of that can be alleviated just through a good working relationship too. It just life is about relationships, and uh, you know you develop that really strong relationship with that feedlot, and you've sold to them before. Uh, there's always, you know, that that becomes almost a non-issue. They trust that, you know, you're doing the best for those animals, you know, and the best for everybody. Right. Thank you very much. So for Reynold, um, for your side of the research fund allocation, um, you showed an increase to forage and grassland research. So are you able to comment on where research is focusing in these areas? On the, the forage and grassland side, yeah, we're focused on, on really three main areas. We're focused on the uh, on forage breeding, obviously. Um, the number of forage breeders we've got in Canada has really, really dropped. I think a number about 20 years ago, I believe there were about 30 forage breeders going on and er, uh, active in Canada. And right now, I think we've got one sort of forage breeder in, in the, or one who's actively involved in forage breeding in the Maritimes. We don't. We have two, I think, in Quebec. We've got none in Ontario. We've got a couple in 
Saskatchewan and and at least one in Alberta. So um, so we've been working really really hard to improve that. So in a couple of ways, partly training grad students to to fill vacancies, and then also working on on uh, you know agriculture Canada and universities to get these people hired. Um, the other thing we've been working on um, pretty heavily is is the the forage agronomy and how to use it um, side, particularly on the uh, the uh, annual forages, so so uh, you know swath grazing, winter grazing, figuring out what crops work and which are economical in in different areas, seeding dates, that kind of thing, um, and then also on the uh, the the forage utilization side, so the the nutritional aspects, the animal digestibility and preference and that sort of thing. So. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, once again, for Cody. Is it appropriate to administer both an antibiotic and a vaccine at the same time? Um, is there any time when it's appropriate to do so? Uh, yeah, so the, the majority of the vaccines that I talked about um, are either a modified live, so that means uh, they are live, but they're usually viral vaccines. Uh, so the antibiotics has no effect on, on the virus side. So anything that's a virus that you're vaccinating with, there's no concern at all. And then when it comes to the bacterial side, the majority of the bacteria are bactrins. They're killed, uh, they're killed fractions of that bacteria. So those bacteria aren't replicating. Uh, and with they're not replicating, then there's no concern using the antibiotics either. Uh, there is a few um, special cases where, where that's not true, especially when you get into autogenous vaccines. Uh, you, could, you could potentially get into but those are very weird, strange uh, exceptions to the rule. Uh, there is one, or I guess a couple, uh, avirulent uh, bacteria vaccines out there on the market, but those ones go up the nose, uh, and administering a, a, an antibiotic with those live bacteria vaccines has no effect. Uh, it, it, it works, it, it immunizes the animal uh, and doesn't neutralize it at all, so no, not a concern. Uh, the only thing that you would want to make sure it when is just from a good uh, beef quality assurance and technique is making sure that, that you're separating your vaccine shot uh, at appropriate distance away from your, uh, from your antibiotic shots based on the size of the animal. All right, thank you very much. So um, the next question is for Brenna. Can you explain where the basis is now and what it's expected to do? Basis for fed cattle? Yes. So the basis for fed cattle is basically par um, cash to cash Alberta to Nebraska right now. Um, we had a very strong basis in Alberta throughout 2015. In the second quarter, we actually had the longest running period at the strongest levels that we've seen historically. But we have seen the U.S. market under um, significant pressure over the last month, and we are seeing prices impacted here over the last week and into this week um, already um, here in Canada. And so we're looking at prices um, that have already dropped seasonally uh, from the spring high to their summer low. And we actually um, tend to see our low in Alberta uh, into September and October. So we're looking at basis levels weakening further back to the historic levels, um, that five-year average, um, over the next four weeks or so um, seasonally. And that November basis um, can actually have a dramatic swing down. So going from par down to a minus 10 or even minus 15 um, in that five-year average. Thank you very much, Brenna. So um, next question is for Cody. Um, you mentioned in your presentation um, the quiet weans. So has there been any large-scale testing done on this? And do you know as to the returns per head they can generate? Yeah, so the, 
the inventor of the quiet ween is a welfare expert at the University of Saskatchewan, or one of the, the I guess, founders. Uh, so the majority of the research is actually from a welfare perspective, and they link back to things that, that are indicators for uh, an improvement of welfare. So things like decreased bawling, uh, decreased locomotion, both on the calf and on the cow side. Uh, they do follow out weights uh, to weaning, so from the implementation of the quiet wean system to the, when you do your, your weaning weight. Uh, and they do show that there is no uh, significant decrease in weight by using them, uh, but there absolutely is no increase. And if you followed that out and did a quiet wean system for 14 days, uh, those calf weights actually will decrease just because compared to the control who are calves out on milk and grass uh, with mums, uh, those calves are just getting less nutrition. Uh, so the, where the benefit is for the quiet wean system is A, it, uh, it decreases the, you know, the stress of those animals, but the benefits then come to the feedlot side and there is the potential of research going to happen, larger uh, scale uh, studies. Uh, but it is, um, I think, more of a funding issue right now when it comes to, to following those cattle uh, and looking at what their, what their BRD pull rates are, what their mortality is, and what happens to their carcass data all the way out to closeout. Uh, but I do know that, that Joe is looking into to being able to do those types of, of larger scale, follow those calves into the feedlot type work, uh, but none exists to date, or very little exists to date. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is for Reynolds. So if industry invests more dollars into research, what are some of the things that BCRC would do with the extra funding? It, we'd be able to do a couple of things. And, and one is we just to continue the kind of research that, that we're currently funding, and you can read all about it on our website, beefresearch.ca. Everything that we funded in the past or present is listed up there. So just to maintain those kind of activities. Um, you know, we'll we'll need more more funding just just to maintain where we're at now. Um, I think the 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 other thing I indicated early earlier on is that industry is getting asked to be more active in funding everything. So it used to be there were some areas of research like animal welfare, right? The stuff that that Cody was just talking about, the the quiet wean stuff, all the anything around animal welfare, animal transport, pain, that kind of thing, behavior. That that wasn't our business. That was public good stuff is how it was defined and if it's public good then then really it was the government's job to fund it and the same could be said for things like like food safety too or environment stuff but what's what's become increasingly apparent is that if if the the results of that research are things that that are going to ultimately impact industry or or uh, inform production practices it's really important that that research happen with industry input to to make sure that it's done in in conditions that that reflect industry practice so that the results that come out of it are are something that are that are meaningful and implementable so if industry is going to be involved industry needs to to put dollars in and the the flip side of that is is that if industry doesn't invest in areas like this, then governments take that as a sign that industry doesn't care and they won't either. And so that's where we've seen um, a, a, a real rollback over the years in things like forage and and even in on the food safety side, we've had to push pretty hard to to, to maintain uh, federal research capacity there. So um, and so that's two things so far just to maintain where we're going partly to increase our funding in new areas that we've never really had the responsibility of being active in before and then thirdly uh, an another thing that we'll be needing to invest in pretty heavily is um, just getting um, new people hired so so not only do governments and universities look to industry to invest in research projects they're also looking to industry to invest in in hiring new professors new researchers I both on the training side as well as things like chair positions industry seed money to to get new new uh, people hired so if industry values those people like likes of, of you know, John McKinnon, Eugene Jans, and people who have um, made significant contributions to the industry over the years. If if we want to see positions like that maintained, it's going to be industry that needs to step up and and fund them. And and that's that's the sort of thing that that uh, increased checkoff dollars on the research side would be going towards. 
Right. Thank you very much. Um, a few more questions here. So this next one is for Brenna. So why don't we see the premiums for preconditioning that are seen in the United States? And does this suggest that um, it might become expected as opposed to a premium? I don't think it's ever going to become expected. One of the things that they have done in the United States is they're very clear um, on what preconditioning is and they have a very set definition um, and their pre-sort sales actually accommodate this in terms of how they're sorted and sold in the auction market and so the auction market system as well as the electronic um, and video sales uh, uh, really work towards um, making a definition to support those premiums. As uh, Cody mentioned, um, one of the challenges we've had here is the communication and the transparency of what is the producer calling preconditioning and what can happen is a producer says I've preconditioned and they have done a couple of the steps. They've done low stress weaning, um, they've boosted their calves and they're still selling them directly off the cow, um, hitting the auction market and going through the system and a feedlot may have actually paid a premium and the producer was unaware of it but the feedlot got burnt and I've talked to a number of feedlots as I've been preparing this and their comment has been that they actually didn't see the benefits and they don't trust the cow-calf producer in the fact that they've done and said what they actually thought had been done and that's one where that certificate from your veterinarian saying this is all of the steps that we've checked um, and this is what we've done we're not just going to call it preconditioning we're going to say it's been boosted it's been low stress weaning they've been bunk broke they've been water trough broke all of these things to show that you know the feedlot that can choose what are the things that are important to them and what are they willing to pay the premium on and it's very clear that in the US the feedlots are definitely seeing that health premium because from 2013 to 2014 the premiums on preconditioned cattle more than doubled so there is definitely value there it's just making sure that we create a system when we do our price discovery at the auction market that we're supporting the ability to have this transparency and have diversity in what the specifications are for those cattle that can be communicated up and down the supply chain all right thank you very much um, we'll do one last question for Cody here so um, the question is with the quiet wean system is there a trade-off between lower stress weaning and the increased stress of handling them twice well one of the things that you can do to to trade off that stress is is actually do a boost vaccination at that time so if you did that vaccine that uh, two weeks prior to to weaning you're kind of getting a double bang for your buck for running those animals through uh, when it comes to the work that, that Joe Stuckey has done, uh, there would be stress, but that was not a measurable stress effect. Uh, it's very, very quick to throw those things on. Uh, there's very little irritation. Uh, in comparison, when he looked at uh, what those cattle do uh, in terms of bawling and, and uh, you know, stress-type behaviors, it is a lot less. Uh, than, than just doing a, an abrupt weaning type situation. So uh, anything you do to an animal is a stressful event for sure. Uh, it's trying to, you know, what is the, the sum of that stress and try to decrease that overall. All right, thank you very much. So um, sorry, I see that there's still some more questions, but um, for the sake of time, we're going to wrap it up now. Um, if you do have any further questions, I encourage you to talk to any one of the presenters tonight, um, as well as your local veterinarian or regional extension specialist as well about preconditioning practices. So just a few more things before we let you go tonight. So one of them is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. So you can go to our website, beefresearch.ca, and click subscribe where you'll be able to sign up for our free email list. If you've got Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. And I also encourage you to visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website, cattle.ca, 
where you can sign up for their free newsletter called Action News. Also, our next webinar will be coming up October 21st, where we'll hear about practical and effective methods of pain control. So once again, if you sign up to our email list, you'll get the information about the next webinar, and you can sign up there as well. Or check back to our webinar page within a couple days, and um, there will be information, and as well as the information to sign up as well. So shortly after this, as soon as the webinar ends, you're going to be asked to complete a short survey about tonight's session and what you are most interested in for future webinar topics. So we do need your feedback to do the best job we can to deliver information that's useful and meaningful to you. So it helps you make informed decisions on doing what's best for your operation. So please take the time to complete that survey and don't hesitate to complete contact me with questions, comments, or suggestions at any time. You're also going to receive an email from me later this week. Um, it will have the link to watch the recording, as well as links to some additional information on preconditioning practices. So that's it for tonight. I'd like to thank all of you at home for joining us. And on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank Reynold, Cody, and Brenna for volunteering their time or expertise. So good night.